Hello everybody, it is Monday. Today is a great day. Why? Because we're here together. We grow together. So, um, hi everybody. <laughs> Hope you are uh, enjoying this August Monday. Um, today's topic, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. How did I become the Kombucha Mama? Why was Hannah Crum the Kombucha Mama? Who... <laughs> <laughs> Who made that happen? Um, but before I do that, I want to do a little show and tell. I'm super excited to show off. So first of all, you can see my awesome mural behind me with our kombucha camp cheer. I'll probably go over that again. Um, hi, Rachel. So good to see you too. Kisses to New York. We're ocean buddies. So she um, she swims at Long Beach and I swim at um, Playa del Rey. But her Long Beach is in New York. <laughs> Um, okay, right. So I want to show you what is going on here at Kombucha Camp. So here we go. This is like if we walk in. Ta-da! Here is our new retail space slash kombucha museum. So we're just starting to put all of our little products here on display. Since we are open Monday through Friday between 8. Um, we're open 8.30 to 5, but we accept... Um, guests between 9 and 4 30 and then I am planning to add some retail hours on Saturday in September um, so this is our awesome mural trust your gut that's my kombucha camp motto we grow together that's the KBI motto kombucha brewers international and this is our cheer so I'm just gonna do the little cheer with you so again this is every letter of kombucha camper it has a meaning and it goes like this we are kombucha campers, keeping our minds and bodies uplifted to create healthy attitudes with kindness, ambition, mindfulness, positivity, equanimity, and respect. Yes. Oh, hi, Sonorana. Nice to see you. Yes, we'd love to talk shop. It's one of my favorite things to do. Oh, look at our pretty butterflies. And this is our newest arrival. Ta-da! We have kombucha on tap now. So we have three flavors. Actually, we have two flavors of kombucha. We're doing the Canna Bliss, Pineapple Tranquility. We have um, summer seasonal flavor Unity, which is cherry lemongrass. And then we also have cold brew coffee. So if you are in Gardena, which is south of LA by about 20 minutes, we invite you to stop on by, get your SCOBYs, get your signed books, um, check out what we've got on display. Oh yeah, let's see what we've got over here. So. They pulled some really old stuff out of our many, many boxes, like the Boo. This is a really old bottle. They now come in cans. Um, Conscious, I don't even know if Conscious Kombucha is still around. Awaken from Hawaii is no longer there. Got a Rowdy Mermaid Growler. Look, we have issues of Symbiosis Magazine. So this is our magazine of the industry. Next issue is coming out soon. These are KCON programs. I was in a little uh, online summit and they sent me a gift, a pillow of myself. It's true, I don't actually print pillows of myself, but I thought it was cute. And then we have the Big Book of Kombucha in Korean, El Gran Libro de Kombucha en Español, some really ancient scobies from our days of doing events. Then over here, look, we have, so this is like show and tell. So Kombucha Wonder Drink, they don't even make a raw product anymore. So, um, <laughs> I kept some of these in bottles to see. Maybe someday we'll go back in time and test them. Oh, cute mirrors. We can see ourselves here. Live soda kombucha. They were an original founding member of KBI. They served on our board. We have kombucha kits for Mensch, one of our local brands here in Southern California. Awesome folks. Vitality in Hawaii. I, I don't think they ever sold it in this can, but it's just so fun to um, reminisce and think of all the people we love so much. Um, so as I mentioned, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how I became the kombucha mama, right? We all have our kombucha origin story. And of course, I would love to hear yours. How did you meet kombucha? Uh, why did you meet kombucha? Was it something that you sought out personally to, um, to help you with something? Or did someone just randomly happen to share some with you? Or did you hear about it? Or you try to sample at a grocery store? So. We all have our little kombucha story, and mine goes like this. So I call it kombucha kismet. 
Kismet is a word that means fate or destiny, and that's how I feel about meeting kombucha because while a lot of people will come to kombucha because they have an illness or they have some sort of ailment or they heard it has amazing digestive properties or you know, for some reason or another, they might've heard about it in order to help support their health. Well, back in the early 2000s, I, hadn't, I wasn't really thinking about my health too much, um, but I did live in Los Angeles and a friend of mine from college, Jeff, um, had moved to San Francisco. I had a little job that took me up to San Francisco. Alex and I flew up there and he graciously allowed us to stay at his apartment. Now, this tour was actually quite, um, significant for many reasons. So we got a tour of his apartment and one of the first stops was the bathroom, bathroom like any other, um, with a shower, but on the shower was a shower filter. And it just was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm already filtering my water to get the chlorine out and remove the fluoride. Why not remove the chlorine from, from my body, right? We're microbial beings, we have microbes all over our body. And when we wash in chlorine, of course, we're creating a little bit of a, um, um, we're like washing away the good bugs potentially. Um, I don't know if you guys have recently seen, there's all this talk about celebrities and how frequently they bathe. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I must have been a celebrity my whole life because I, I'm, I'm a little bit shower adverse. Uh, obviously when, uh, when my body tells me it's time, I definitely take one, but I'm also someone who likes to go as long as possible between cleanings, partially because I'm protecting my body biome. But um, that said, I don't wish for a cloud to be preceding me. So, um, <laughs> but I thought that was an interesting topic of conversation. So there's a shower filter and the shower filter removes chlorine. That's life changing. We now have an entire filter on our house. Do you filter your water? Do you Berkey? Do you like, how do you consume water? What is your favorite kind of water? Do you do, you do um, remineralized RO? So just curious to hear what kind of water. Do you put crystals in your water? Do you have energy intentions? Um, I have to admit, I've not been a fan of water. And I think that came from drinking tap water as a kid and then the tap water changing and just my body being like, mm, this doesn't do it for me. So I love kombucha water because that way I'm putting a little flavor in there. It's diluting my kombucha. It's not as intense, but I'm definitely getting that benefit. Plus I, it just tastes better to me. So it's kind of like a little squeeze of lemon, but that's, that's my tip, kombucha water. There's even some brands that sell it, Agua Bucha out of uh, Florida by Mothers. They make a kombucha water in a can. So if you're looking for a healthier substitute to those uh, seltzers, that are just adding flavorings of sorts, then um, you can make your own by combining bubbly water with your kombucha. That's really delicious. The next stop on the tour was the kitchen. And um, what we found in there that was intriguing and stuck with me was this stuff called Sole, S-O-L-A-Y. And basically it was a big crystal of pink salt in water and they drink the salt water. Now this is back in 2002. I don't really know much about nutrition, but I had heard salt was bad for you. So why would you be purposely, intentionally making salt water to drink? That just seems so baffling. And now of course, pink Himalayan salt is the salt that I use. I also have some Celtic sea salt and kosher salt. You, what's your favorite salt? What salt do you like? Um, and then I remembered like in Chicago growing up and you would drive on the highway and you'd pass the Morton salt and there'd be these huge mountains of salt just sitting exposed to the traffic and all the particulate and I'm just like oh I'm glad I don't eat that salt anymore. Now these salts have a higher content and diversity of minerals but they may not have iodine which of course we know we need to help support a healthy thyroid but there's lots of other ways we can get that in our diet naturally seaweed of course being the big one that comes to mind but there's lots of other ways so salt water it was like what the heck is this and i've learned so much of course in these almost 20 years since since that first tour and then, of course, we came to a room and on a table, there were all these jars and they were covered and they go, that's the kombucha. I never heard of kombucha. I had no idea what it was. It was just all this weird googly stuff hanging out in a jar and I was just super intrigued. I was like, what is this kombucha stuff? Now we didn't even taste it. So the kombucha was still brewing. We didn't have a chance to taste it. And so um, 
We just that night we also went out to Cafe Gratitude, the first time I'd sort of encountered raw um, foods. Obviously, in Southern California, uh, we have plenty of healthy diets and whatnot. But it was just sort of an interesting trip, and in that a lot of new ideas, a lot of new information was presented. So it was it was quite a lot. So when I got back to LA um, in 2002 and went to my Whole Foods, there's a phenomenon called Yellow Jeep. Are you familiar with it? And I'm sure there's lots of different terms for it, but from the artist's way, uh, Yellow Jeep. So a Yellow Jeep is like, let's say you see, you see one Yellow Jeep and now all of a sudden you'll see them everywhere. It's more like when something comes into your field of consciousness you'll start to see that thing popping up again and again. So that's sort of a yellow Jeep phenomenon. So what happened is, of course, now, whereas I've been to Whole Foods many times, I'd never noticed <laughs> rows and shelves of kombucha. All of a sudden there they were popping out at me. And so I went to the store and I grabbed my first bottle of kombucha. It was a GT's Ginger Aid. What was your first kombucha? What was your first flavor? I'm really curious to hear. Definitely drop a note in the comments. Um, I would love to hear your first sip of kombucha. What was it like? Did you get kombucha face? Right? There's like a lot of people who aren't ready for that tangy flavor, especially if you're drinking a GT's back in the early 2000s. Um, it definitely had a very tangy specific profile. And um, right like this, that little sour kombucha face. That actually has become the face I make when drinking sweet drinks. <laughs> Kombucha has so completely transformed my palate that I can't tolerate sugar like I used to. Um, and if something's too sweet, oh, I make that same yucky face. Um, but for me, now let, let's do a little context here. Why would I like kombucha? Who am I as a human being? All right, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so at the time I was sad, standard American diet, I was... 25 or so, um, 26. I'm really bad at math, so probably, let's see if that was 2002 and I'm born in 75, you know, somewhere in the 20s. Um, a flair for food did not get the sour face because they'd already been drinking apple cider vinegar. So yeah, kombucha being an acetic acid ferment, it has that tanginess. And so if your palate is already accustomed to that, then kombucha is going to be super light. It'll be almost sweet, right? Um, Bucci is delicious. So I was sad. I was eating, you know, basically like college food, right? I was packaged ramen, prepackaged food, stuff that was not exactly supporting a healthy lifestyle per se. Um, now sometimes it's like frozen chicken or this or that. Um, so not everything came out of a box or a can, but I had a microwave, all those things. And so I, I literally was not getting any fermented foods in my diet. I wasn't getting any um, nutrients in a living form in terms of this sort of enzymes and these organic acids. So there was a lack in my life. I just didn't, it hadn't manifested into any specific issue. And so when I opened up that bottle of GT's ginger aid, took my first sip. like the angels were singing every nerve ending was alive like it was not a flavor I was expecting there was like this weird glob floating in there and but I loved it and you know why it reminded me of pickle juice now growing up I was the girl sneaking the pickle juice out of the pickle jar I think again like because of that low salt trend maybe my body was actually craving salt and so I really love the salty flavor of pickle juice I've always loved pickles um, it's been one of my favorite foods. Now, of course, these are vinegar pickles because that's what was available. You know, those sort of Vlasics or, um, you know, whatever those dill pickle chips were. And I just loved, loved drinking that pickle juice. And so I think that tangy flavor resonated. And of course, my body like instantly was like electrified by all these nutrients, these B vitamins, these organic acids. And again, I'm not talking about massive doses or massive quantities, but when you're talking about a body that doesn't have any of them, it's a lot and it's exciting. And so um, I really just was like, oh, this is so good. Now back then, you know, a GT's is like $5 a bottle. It was very expensive. And so 
my thirst quickly outgrew my budget. And I think that's what I tell a lot of people is when your thirst outgrows your budget, that's when you come looking for kombucha camp because you're like, I love this stuff. I need it in my life, but I just can't. It's not fitting my budget. Now, in all reality, right, if you're buying a fancy coffee drink, you're probably spending that amount anyways, but you know, we all have to pick and choose <laughs> what's important. And, um, and so for me, I decided I was gonna make it because I'd seen my friends making it. Monkey see, monkey do. Um, so I was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Now the f ironic thing here is I'm not a cook. I'm not very good at cooking. I'm sort of real primitive in my cooking skills. And I mention that only because I want to give those folks out there who feel like, can I make kombucha? I ruin everything. Like. I'm just, it's gonna be scary, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be a challenge, and um, yeah, there's a learning curve. It is an art, it's a craft, it's a craft brewing, but the reality is any cooking is craft. Like let's say you have a recipe and you follow all the instructions, you have all the ingredients, it does not mean that it will turn out perfect or delicious on that first try, because it's a craft, because cooking requires all of our senses, and that's the same with fermentation, it requires all of our senses. We need to first select quality ingredients, and so the smelling of them and squeezing them and ensuring that they have good quality. Then we need to um, taste, how we get a taste as we go, because if we don't taste as we go, we don't know um, where the flavor profile is. Do we need to add more seasoning? In the case of kombucha, we taste as we go because that's gonna tell us how much of the sugar has been converted. So that way we're able to ascertain when is this brew ready for my palate? which is the fun part of making it at home, is you customize the flavor profiles exactly to you. And it's so interesting how many people have, um, you know, of course had commercial kombucha, thought it was delicious, start making their own, and of course their own just like tastes so good. And I think it's because, again, we're customizing to our palate and we're imbuing our own energy into that. We're putting our love into it. It's not to say the kombucha producers aren't putting love into it, but there's just a different relationship that starts to occur when you and those microbes really get to know each other and you create your own sort of, you know, biome with the booch. You have your booch biome that you're working on. So your energies are vibing, your microbes are communicating. And, um, and so that's really the fun, one of the fun parts about making it at home. And then of course smell. So kombucha has a distinctive odor. The interesting thing is, is once you get used to it, you can't really smell it as much until someone comes over and goes, hmm, what's that smell? It smells tangy. And you're like, oh <laughs> yeah, that's the kombucha. Um, but we quickly adapt to that sense of smell. And so that smell is important because it's indicating the fermentation is going on. Of course our eyes, are looking at it, we see the scoby growing, we see that new pellicle come in, so like the mother can be anywhere in the jar, but that new layer grows across the top. It's so important, it's such a fun affirmation of the process, we really enjoy seeing that come to life. Um, and then, of course, looking at how the color lightens over time, because as the tannins and the tea are consumed by the organisms, that starts to shift the color as well. You might see little bubbles popping up as the CO2 is being formed. And so again, we're just, it's any kind of cooking, any kind of fermentation, any kind of kitchen art uh, requires all of our senses observation. And again, your first batches, and mine certainly were this way, they did not turn out perfect. <laughs> but they were delicious enough. And the real breakthrough was when I was able to make a flavor that my husband enjoyed. So like he, his story is that he had been you know, again, we're, stand, we're sad, we're standard American diet. You know, he had a very busy lifestyle, working long hours, he was in the film industry, and um, you know, Gatorade for breakfast. Gotta get that energy, that bleh, glucose shot right to the gut to uh, power you up. Um, he's not been a, much of a coffee drinker, uh, so he was doing that, but then every night, taking an antacid pill. So when I finally made pink lemonade, which is strawberry lemon thyme, it's one of our signature flavors, recipes in the book, um, within two weeks, of course he swapped out his Gatorade, he was drinking kombucha every day, and he realized at night he could stop taking that antacid pill. And so it really transformed Alex's relationship to food in general, right? Because Kombucha, when you start to drink it, it transforms your palate. So it like kind of 
scrapes away, it takes a little time, but it scrapes away the constant impact of all the refined sugar and processed sugar that is in you know, processed foods, which is what a lot of us eat because they say healthy on the package or low fat or good for you or bleh, right? Bleh, this much protein, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, the processed food industry is not your friend either. Um, you know, they are, they're not our friends in a lot of ways. And the biggest one being is that they'll make products that are safer and healthier for you and send them to Europe because Europe has stricter standards, but they have no moral compunction. They don't feel bad at all selling us total crap here in the United States. So they will put weird chemicals, weird preservatives. So think about it. Like, why do we add a preservative to a food? To extend shelf life, right? Because we don't know, when is the consumer gonna buy it? How long is it gonna sit there? It's gotta be made and processed and shipped, da -da 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 -da, right? It's not fresh. Well, what do preservatives do? I just brought the camera close. They um, kill bacteria. What's your guts? That's right, bacteria. So if we're eating a lot of preservatives, we're unintentionally creating a negative um, reaction in our guts, all while the labels say healthy, all while not understanding what it is we're doing. So again, all of this information about food and nutrition, this all started to come after I included kombucha in my diet because I just started to wake up to what is going into my body. And that's where trust your gut comes into play. It was the realization that each body, each microbiome, each human, we all have. We have DNA, we have environment, we have environmental toxins, we have genetics, we have what was passed down from our mothers, um, all of these things. So your, your biome initially comes from your mothers, you're coming out of the vaginal canal. That has changed to include bacteria that help you to digest the, the breast milk when you're being breastfed, which also passes on immune system. So there's a lot of things that we receive from being born, like being born is our initial inoculation. Now they think the, they used to think the womb is sterile. Of course it isn't, nothing is probably sterile. There's probably microbes <laughs> and, and organisms everywhere. But that said, it, um, you know, and then of course we've had a lot of people born with C-section and when they didn't understand this information, what we found is those children often had a higher incidence of asthma and um, allergies and food allergies and things like this because imagine, right, the bacteria on your stomach are different from the bacteria inside of the woman's vagina. And so what they now started doing is if you have a C-section, they will swab that liquid and put it all over the baby so that at least they're trying to get replicate that inoculation of that initial microbiome so being bacteria sapiens being bacteria powered it is so crucial that we're paying attention to the things that support our microbiome prebiotics probiotics etc as well as like sort of different ways in which we're interacting with the world so that we're always maintaining a healthy microbiome uh, because as we're learning more and more, and of course I've been saying this for years, this is your first brain. As a fetus inside of the body, right, the brain tissue and the gut tissue form at the exact same time and then they differentiate into two systems that are still connected with the vagus nerve. And so it's always that this needs to be in order, then this can be in order. It doesn't go the other way around. And so that's why I really think of our gut as the first brain. And so when you're thinking about brain food and what's gonna help my brain and the neurotransmitters and the chemicals and all of that, this is your immune system. Ah, it starts right here. Babies, right? Ah, they're constantly putting stuff in their mouth. Ah. So part of how I became the kombucha mama was because I just, like once I embraced kombucha, I went to the library, I checked out every single book I could find, I combed through them, then I discovered um, the internet has research papers, and so I was just combing through PubMed, of just like <laughs> digesting all of this information, and it was so exciting, and I was really passionate about it because I saw a tremendous change in my energy levels, in my husband, and how we were feeling, and I just, like kombucha <laughs> became so important to me. And so I'd carry it around with me everywhere. I'd usually have it in just like a GT's bottle. That way, if anyone asked about it, I'd be like, oh, here, just read this bottle, except what's in there is my kombucha. Um, 
And so I just, I became just like a little, um, I don't want to say proselytizer because I'm not trying to convince people, but just someone who had it and was willing to share. I'd project it out into the universe. And um, I took an artist by workshop. I don't know about you, but in my life, I'm someone who's always searching, seeking, hunting. Um, you know, I think it's a true statement to say we all had a traumatic childhood in some form or fashion. Um, it, you know, we've all suffered abuse in some form or fashion, and that has massive impacts on who you are as a human being and how you present yourself as an adult, especially if we don't ever deal with that aspect of who we are. So I think part of me and who I've been as a human being is just to like try to understand those things. And so when my husband took an artist way workshop because of a documentary film he was working on, um, I was super intrigued. And you know, <laughs> the ironic thing is, is I had worked in bookstores uh, before I ended up, before I went to college, so like 19. And that book, because I'm from Chicago, was like a huge bestseller. It's by Julia Cameron, and she's a Chicago-based person. And it was always on the bestseller list. I'm like, artist way, what's the, uh, like I was, um, you know, I was raised in a household where you like made fun of things to feel good about yourself. And so I was like, oh, what's this thing I don't understand? Oh, I'm going to reject that because I don't understand it. Well, since I had taken this course and he was raving about how good it was and uncovering sort of like, what it was you know so part of the artist way is it's a 12-week course and in it you're writing morning pages so this is just a place to like brain dump all of the anxiety stress whatever you know whatever that sort of voices in your head is just like to get them out um then another piece of it is you go on artist dates so this could be a way of thinking about like taking care of your inner child or allowing yourself to show up and do the things that really feed your creative spirit um, that oftentimes we say, well, I don't have time for that, or I need to work, or, right, like, we sort of put this wall around taking care of ourselves. I think that has changed a lot. I think our, our culture has really come to understand how valuable play is and how important it is that we nourish our creative spirit and, and that we honor that um, inner child. But um, at that time, it wasn't something I was doing a lot of because I was so, like, obligated. Um, I was pursuing acting. I was in improv classes, theater theater group, um, scene study, right? It was also having, you know, part-time jobs where I was on unemployment. So it was just like this sort of melange. I was just sort of like surfing through life. What am I doing? What's next? Because then as an actress, I was like, but I don't want to do a commercial for that. And I don't want to do a commercial for that. And, and I was like, well, how am I ever going to have a career? Like that's where like everybody starts with commercials for the most part. In any case, unless you're legacy and then you just sort of get auditions and and then you're in movies. Um, so in this Artist Way workshop, 12 weeks, um, lots of amazing things happened. Thank you, Kelly Morgan. It was an amazing session. This was back in 2004, right? So two years into drinking kombucha, loving kombucha, making my own kombucha, starting to tell people about kombucha. I'm just like, ah, kombucha crazy. Um, still am. Uh, and by the end of this workshop, what had been revealed to me was that I needed to teach people about kombucha. I needed to take all of this information, all of this excitement, all of this love and passion that I was experiencing for this beverage and whoa, give it to the world. And so that's how kombucha camp with a K because I'm cute and clever and I'm a big word nerd. Um, I studied foreign language, so my college degree, I have one in um, Spanish language and literature and one in Mandarin Chinese language and literature. I'm a word nerd. I love word origins. I just, I'm a total dork about that stuff. I love it. Um, and really, it's that like getting to the root. I want to go to the root meaning. I want to find the root word. I want to pick words that have specific meanings because they harmonize with what I'm trying to say. So I really love words because they can... I mean, they're spells, right? When you're spelling, like you're writing out the word, you're literally um, like a manifestation spell. So, right, we are amazing generative beings. We are massive manifestors. We are so capable of creating and shifting and, uh, and shaping the reality around us. And a lot of the ways we do that is through words. And so we can create our own spells. That's why I like to put little messages of blessing on my kombucha because I want to infuse that in there. Right? And we've all seen some of those studies they've done where, 
you know, you'll talk to a plant, you'll say nice things, or you'll talk to a plant and say mean things, and the nice one grows and the other one deteriorates, right? So we all understand how powerful words and language are. So kombucha camp is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to teach people and make it fun. And so camp, which honestly is not something I did as a kid, but um, I know people have a lot of positive feelings around it. So kombucha camp, and it was cute and clever. And so that's how kombucha camp was born. And so people would show up to my tiny little home. Um, we lived in a guest house. So they'd show up to my tiny little home. We squeeze in. I'd pull out the kombucha, we'd squeeze into the kitchen, everybody barely fitting and <laughs> show them how the process works. I'd talk about it. And in fact, that tiny little home, you can still see in the expert village videos that we shot in 07. So, you know, that was sort of 2007 is when the internet as an education tool was just sort of, you know, sort of coming into being in college. There were some blogging sites or whatever, and it was just sort of like, hmm, do I really wanna share all my thoughts with the public? Like. Who cares about this right we didn't totally understand how the internet would become completely our, our entire life and way of interacting until um, until later in time but in 04 I started teaching kombucha camp so trust your gut came out of all the research I was doing and understanding that each person's microbiome signature is different and trust your gut is not trust your taste buds Right, so there's another concept here that I tied together, which is called close the feedback loop. Right, everything is a feedback loop. You do something, there's a response. So you could even think of it as energy. For all energy that goes out, there's an opposite and equal action, right? So there's this constant like exchange of energy. And I say this and I get this reaction. And I do this and I get this reaction. And so closing the feedback loop is tying what you're putting into your body with how your body then feels. Because in this country, in order to sell us more products that we don't actually need, or to convince us to eat food that isn't food, it's simulacrum, it's like an imitation of food, and the push is really on with all that weird lab-generated stuff they're trying to voice on people. Um, but closing the feedback loop is how we actually start to investigate and understand how is my body physiologically responding to the inputs I'm providing it. And kombucha, in my opinion, is a super easy way for anyone who's not totally clued in to how that works to make that connection. So you drink that kombucha. Like my first sip of kombucha in the morning, within 30 seconds, a minute, I can feel I feel my organs relax. There's like nutrients going in. There's acids. There's trace amounts of B vitamins. There's just, it just opens everything up and creates a feeling of relaxation. And when we remember that the root cause of all dis-ease is stress, right? Stress can manifest in any form. Stress can be a crappy diet, right? That's stressful to the body. Stress could be your lifestyle. Stress could be your job. Stress could be the relationship you're in. Stress can come from anything, and we need stress, right? So it's not about eliminating all stress, but it's managing stress. It's maintaining balance with the stress. Like balance, balance, balance. That's really the key of everything we're supposed to do. Um, but that said, um, closing the feedback loop and not trusting your taste buds. And here's an example I give. So candida overgrowth, right? We've all heard of candida albicans. It's something we're very familiar with in this day and age, especially as we know a lot of people have gut dysbiosis. They have a lot of um, microbiome issues. Um, again, these environmental toxins, these food toxins, the brain toxins from all the propaganda and the information that's so confusing and keeps you in these weird states. Um, there's a lot of stuff we have to try to sort through. And, um, so when you have candida overgrowth, so it's an opportunistic pathogen. What that means is, in fact, candida albicans lives in our system naturally. It's supposed to be there. We need it. The problem is if it gets out of balance. If it gets out of balance, then it starts to overproliferate. It starts to dominate. And it starts to demand that you eat food that causes it to reproduce. It's like it starts controlling you. And that's why trust your gut isn't just a like, oh, I'm just gonna do whatever my gut tells me. Like there's a certain amount of education you need to give yourself. You need to read and understand information. 
um, as well as paying attention to that feedback loop. Um, because your gut is going to give you this information. So the example is like, so with the candida, it's craving sugar. Now you eat the sugar, the sugar tastes good on your tongue. Soon after you're bloated, you have a rash, like you don't feel good. And so even though in the moment of eating that sugar, which these organisms are telling you to do so they can continue to proliferate and continue to take over your system, if you close the feedback loop, what you quickly realize is, I feel not so great when I eat these foods. I don't have energy. I have brain fog. I feel depleted, right? And so closing the feedback loop is um, really crucial to starting to make those shifts. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. It's work. It's practice. It takes time, especially depending on where your body is. You might need some additional support, supplementation. Highly recommend working with functional diagnosticians, with uh, people who can do a microbiome test, who can do a stool test, who can help you better understand what's going on inside your body. Um, the sooner you start to understand that information, then you can start to tweak little things here and there. And here's the thing, right? As much as we've been told there's a magic pill or just do this and you'll be cured, it's not how nature or reality works. Um, the reality is it takes time. These are subtle. It wasn't one fast food meal or sugary soda that got you where you are today. It was a buildup and accumulation of those things over time. And so it's um, honoring that this is a process, this is a journey. And kombucha has had varied effects throughout my journey. It has created many different instances of healing. And also as the layers are peeled back like an onion, other issues then are allowed to come to the surface because, so first of all, let's just talk about that. Like the kombucha, the acids created by kombucha, gluconic, glucuronic acid, they literally support your liver. What is your liver for? It helps you to live. <laughs> um, literally, it, you know, everything that we consume, the liver then processes it, right? So you start the digestive process with the saliva in the mouth, your teeth break it up, it's going into your system, the bacteria breaking it apart. And before those nutrients then pass to the rest of your body, they go through the liver. And the liver creates its own glucuronic acid. Now the problem is it doesn't create enough because we're so overexposed. The chemicals in the deodorant, the chemicals in the scented candles, the chemicals in the laundry detergent, the chemical, the chemical, the chemical, the chemical. This country does not care about you. Those, those, com those corporations do not care about you. They've proven time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. This is why we have to be our best advocates. We have to be the detectives to find the products that aren't poisoning us. It's challenging and it's frustrating because this is the 21st century and you'd think by now we'd actually have a government that cares enough to prevent corporations. Or let's go another step. Why do they even need the government to tell them not to do that? Why? Why don't they just make the moral choice? We are not going to create products that harm people. Period. How about that? How about you just start there? Start with I am a corporation. I'm going to make products. And I'm not going to harm people with them. All right. You can tell I'm passionate about this. So the glucuronic acid in your liver then bonds to toxic molecules. So xenobiotics, these are things that come from outside your body, medicines, things like this. It bonds to those molecules. And once that bond is created, it can't be broken. And so then through hydrolysis, which is a fancy way of saying we drink water and we pee it out, we flush them out of our body, which is why drinking water with kombucha is always recommended. So that water kombucha I mentioned earlier, that's a great way to get a little extra water with it, or drink your kombucha, then drink some water because it's just gonna help with that flushing process. Now what happens is if you don't have enough glucuronic acid naturally present in your liver, it then sequesters those toxins. It doesn't want them to get into your body, it's trying to protect you. And so it sequesters them into your fat cells. And so over time, your body just continues to accumulate, 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 all these toxins. And then it goes into crisis mode. Then it makes you sick. Then it starts to say, hey, human, wake up. Listen to me. Hello, there's a human body here. Why are you poisoning me? I can't handle it anymore. Please, please listen to me. And this is pain and this is ailments and this is... And unfortunately, the allopathic system is set up to, oh, well, let's get rid of the symptoms. 
Let's just pretend that isn't there. It's just like with trauma. Let's sweep it under the rug. Let's pretend that doesn't exist. Suppress, suppress, suppress. Happy, happy, happy. Suppress, suppress, suppress. Ah, break down. All right, and that's kind of how our system works. <laughs> These are the metaphors at all the levels because they, they all apply. But what kombucha does is it starts to bond with those toxic molecules. And over time, right, the longer we drink it, the more that we, um, small amounts, small amounts, small amounts. This is a process. It didn't take one day for all of those toxins to get in there. It's not gonna take one bottle of booch, a week of booch, a month of booch, a year of booch. It's gonna take a lot of booch and not just kombucha, of course. A variety of fermented foods, switching away from processed foods, finding healthier options, going to your farmer's market, right? Like it takes effort in order to change. Getting rid of those toxic um, chemicals out of your life seeking out healthier ones go to momovation.com she tests stuff and lets you know what's safe to buy um, go to ewg working group they have a whole database of products that they rank yes it sucks that we as consumers have to be the ones to take on the burden of this work but at the end of the day it's our bodies it's our temples that we need to honor and exalt and we do that by sourcing these better quality products and so how kombucha helps is it bonds those toxic molecules and it helps you to slowly, slowly, over time, gradually release them. And so sometimes when we start to release those toxins, we get, they come back, right? Like on their way out, they might express again. And so some people will experience like a light fever, a little bit of a rash or this or that. And so again, you have to trust your gut. No doctor even understands what's happening inside your body. And we've heard so many examples of this. How many women talk about symptoms and get completely ignored? Nah, you're crazy, go home. Now they're having a heart attack, right? And the fact that we haven't even studied how women's bodies respond differently than men's bodies. Like we've only used the male body as sort of the example to study these things. It's, it's just baffling again here in the 21st century that we still, still have to deal with these issues. But the more you learn your body, the more you figure out what's right for you. And that's why like following a strict dietary, paleo, vegan, whatever, it can help at first for sure because it's getting you off the processed foods, but then you gotta listen to your body. If you're not eating animal products and someday you crave one, have an animal product. We are omnivores. <laughs> we evolved, our big brains are the direct result of consuming animal products. And the reality is that, you know, all these dietaries can help in the short term, but it's like, what's the long term? Long term, we need balance. Long term, we need variety. Because that's how we were, um, that's how we were created. We we're created for diversity, right? We were nomads who travel around. We'd eat a little of these berries in season, then we'd pull some leaves off a of fir tree, and now we're um, digging in the dirt and getting microbes that way, and finally we killed an animal, and now we have a big harvest, and we're tanning the high, like variety, variety, variety. It's never monocropping, right? Omnivore's Dilemma lays this out very clearly about how wheat, corn, and soy, it's in everything. And so we're really eating a mono diet as opposed to the diversity we need. Okay. So we, travel, we covered kombucha kismet, we covered trust your gut, we talked about closing the feedback loop, and all of this is about healthy boundaries create a healthy culture, right? So the example, the template, the beautiful symbiosis that we witness in watching that SCOBY grow, why we're so fascinated by it, is we're witnessing a culture that has learned how to cooperate intraspecies, bacteria in the yeast, in order to create a safe, healthy environment, right? And we're the stewards of that balance, right? Human beings are an integral role. Kombucha, you're not just gonna find it growing in the wild. There aren't just natural deposits of tea and sugar um, that then they're gonna land in. Um, and so the, we're also part of that symbiosis. We are part of that relationship. But what it teaches us is when we have the vinegar of truth, right, the low pH, those acids, when we have the light of truth, we know the sun is antimicrobial, when we start to um, break down those bonds. So let me go back a step. 
pathogens, right? What we think of pathogens, which again, germ theory was disproven a long time ago. There's this idea that like you come into contact with a bad germ and now you're sick. That's not accurate. And um, legendarily, even Pasteur, who I think did a lot of harm in this world and not a lot of good, um, we can talk about that another time, but <laughs> on his deathbed, he's, he recanted, he says, it's not the germ or the microbe, it's the terrain. Where's that terrain? You got it. It's right freaking here. This is your terrain. And that's why we have to make sure our soil is incredibly neutrified. Our, we carry a bacterial cloud. We're like pig pen. We just can't see it. But we have a force field, literally a force field of bacteria that surround us. And so when you meet someone and you have this gut reaction of, oh my gosh, I feel like I've known this person forever. I have such a good vibe with them. Or you have a reaction, oh, something's off, something's weird. I don't trust this. Trust your gut. Your microbes, we don't even fully understand how they communicate. Quorum sensing, chemicals, whatever. They are communicating. To me, bacteria are our ESP. They are letting us know. They are sensing that other person's force field and bacteria, and they're giving you vital information so you can make an informed decision. The problem is, we get so programmed to not listen to our instincts, to not listen to our body, to not listen or validate or honor those that information that's coming up. Now, it doesn't mean every thought you have is correct, right? So there's also differentiation here. It's not just all one or all the other, right? There's always subtlety, there's always interpretation, there's always you know filtering and making sure. But the reality is, is when we start to trust our guts, when we start to listen to the information our biome is giving us because we've shifted our diet, we've gotten rid of the toxic chemicals, we're clearing away our pineal gland, we're able to receive that information more clearly, we're in more alignment with the earth, we're in more alignment with, the, with our mother, with the planet that sustains and nourishes us and gives us life when we're in that. So again, opportunistic pathogen. Pathogens by their nature are weak. What's the proof? We'd all already be dead. If pathogens were so dang strong, we'd all already be dead. And so the, mo the evidence we have is that we live and we're alive. And that means pathogens are weak. And pathogenic policies, pathogenic people, parasites, same kind of thing. When we start to recognize those in our life and we create that healthy boundary, it shifts. Everything shifts. And what creates a healthy culture is healthy boundaries. Now you could say the golden rule is a healthy boundary. Do unto others as you do unto yourself. But the problem is we gotta first treat ourselves right. <laughs> um, a lot of times because, and I'm no different, I'm a child of trauma, I've suffered abuse. Um, I believe we all have because um, heretofore, we haven't had a practice as a culture in talking about trauma, in exposing it for what it is, in saying that it's not okay and it's not appropriate. And I really think that's sort of the beauty of the moments right now is all this conversation, all this unwillingness to tolerate abusive behavior that before was just, well, normal. You're just supposed to deal with it and think it's okay. And some might say that's made people too sensitive, but this is, we're still feeling our way through this. But the more you pay attention to those signs and symbols, the more you pay attention to what creates a healthy culture within yourself. You know, yeah, I think there is something to Darwinism, survival of the fittest, but how are you the fittest? It isn't like the fit individual, right? Individuals don't exist. We exist in community. And so communities are what really, <laughs> that is what creates that healthy culture. We don't live in isolation. We can't, we can't. Who's growing our food? Unless you're the hermit in the woods, which is another option. And there's not a lot of them, or there might be more of them than we realize, but the reality is the vast majority of us live in communities, but we may not have community. And that's where creating these healthy boundaries, creating this healthy culture, that is what ultimately is going to help elevate the society and culture. The problem is everyone's in inflammation. People are poisoned. You can see by their behavior. You can see by the way they respond to things. Social media has amplified, has made it really obvious where we are not able to collaborate and cooperate. 
but my true belief is that is our nature because we are bacterial sapiens and so at our nature we are like bacteria we seek we crave symbiosis with other healthy beings that allow us to create a community that can thrive all right guys so how did i become the kombucha mama kombucha kismet i fell in love i was inspired to teach and gosh golly um I'll share another part of my story at another Instagram live, but this, I just, it's passion, it's love, it's, I just, I love this planet, I love people, I love um, culture, I love this exciting, dynamic, crazy time that we're living in, and I think the real opportunity here is for us to focus on our health, focus on immunity, focus on listening to what makes sense for us, and acting from there, right? So I have a little song I'll, I'll share. This is just my song, this is a song that came for me, and I'm just someone who likes to sing. But it goes like this. I am sovereign, I am free. Love is my frequency. I am sovereign, I am free. Love is my frequency. And then you can go, la. I think it sounds like a box song at some point, but you get the point. When you make those songs, when you resonate, when you vibrate, when you give yourself that information, you are sending messages to your signals, to your body, to everything that that is what's true. And I, uh, we are all sovereign beings. We are all free. I get that we can feel, but this is where the more we release, the more we get rid of those toxins, the more we're clearer and in our bodies, the more we can come together in community. So thank you everybody for watching today. Um, we'll be back next week with more information and uh, really appreciate all of you. So thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.